Welcome to session three in security, privacy, and innovation, reshaping law for the AI era. This symposium is co-sponsored by the Reese Center on Law and Security at NYU Law School, the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University, Just Security, and the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. It's my pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Ruth Okereji. I am a co-director at the Berkman Klein Center and your moderator for this session. The previous two sessions of the symposium have addressed responses to AI-enabled surveillance and digital authoritarianism and the protection of constitutional values and the rule of law in the AI era. This is the concluding session. And this session is entitled Protecting and Promoting AI Innovation, Patent Eligibility Reform as an Imperative for National Security and Innovation. Our session this afternoon will consist of two one hour panels with a 10 minute intermission in between. The first panel will feature a debate between arguments for and against reform to the patent eligibility doctrine. Those of you who are patent experts um, attending this webinar will know that this has been a hot topic um, for some years now. The debate around whether the US needs to reform its patent eligibility doctrine has been ongoing, as I've mentioned, for some time, at least during the last decade. There were efforts at reform in 2019 on the Hill that were stalled, but that did not end the varying opinions that continue to exist about whether we need to reform, what we need to reform, and why. If and how does the patent system, and particularly the patent eligibility uh, regimes, affect the ability of the United States to expand innovation in AI and in other critical technologies is really the key question of the day. The National Security Commission on AI is an independent commission set up by Congress in, in 2019 um, and to really look at the intersection of national security and intelligence and associated technologies. The commission assesses that we are in a technological competition with other nations, particularly with China, and focused in particular on securing national security and economic interests, as well as in promoting democratic values. In March um, or on March 1 of this year, the commission issued a final report. The second part of the report focused on winning the technology competition, including an entire chapter on intellectual property. The commission's high level IP recommendations um, are that in essence, the US should recognize intellectual property as a national priority and develop a comprehensive national IP plan to reform and create IP policies and regimes to incentivize, expand, and protect artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. The commission also set forth a non-exhaustive list of 10 IP considerations to assess and to inform policymakers in developing such new approaches to national IP strategies. One of these considerations is patent eligibility. What is patent eligibility and do current legal regimes need to be changed in light of national security and economic interests? We have a distinguished panel with us today. Um, many of them are not strangers and I'm delighted that they will be here to help shed light, contribute to the debate and reflect on the commission's recommendations. We will start with, former, uh, with our former Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, uh, Paul Michel, who will set the stage for us on why patent eligibility is a topic of discussion and why it's relevant to winning this competition globally. We will then have a debate between former USPTO Director Andre Iancu and David Jones, the Executive Director of the High Tech Inventors Alliance. Their debate will focus on whether the US patent eligibility doctrine should be reformed at all. Before we begin uh, the discussion, um, there is a brief note on CLE credit. Um, you should note that the event comprising both panels of this session has been approved uh, for two credit hours of professional practice category for the New York State CLE uh, credit. So please take note of that. Um, at a certain point in the program, just for logistics, we will pause 
uh, to display and to read aloud a CLE course code um, or set of codes. And so those of you seeking CLE credit need to record the code um, or codes and submit them um, on your attorney affirmation form. Um, most attendees, I believe all attendees, should have received a link to the attorney affirmation form in their reminder email for the event. Um, and the form can also be sent after the event is concluded. Uh, please note that the event is appropriate uh, for um, both newly admitted and experienced attorneys. I will now introduce um, Judge Michelle, and I know, of course, many of you already know and are familiar um, with the judge, but I do think it's important to start with an introduction um, of the former Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Judge Michelle served for more than 22 years on the Federal Circuit, retiring on May 31st, 2010. From December um, 2004 until his retirement, he discharged the duties of chief judge of this um, important court, serving simultaneously on the US Judicial Conference, the judiciary's governing body, and by appointment of the chief justice on its seven judge executive committee. Judge Michelle, former Judge Michelle, uh, judged several thousand appeals. He authored more than 800 opinions, um, one third of them concerning intellectual property law. Intellectual Asset Management Magazine inducted him into its Hall of Fame. He was designated as one of the 50 most influential leaders in intellectual property law in the world. His contributions have been recognized by the American Intellectual Property Law Association, Intellectual Property Owners um, Education Foundation, the ABA Association Intellectual Property Section, and many more. Um, in 2010, the Los Angeles IPN uh, was renamed in his honor. Judge Michelle received the Jefferson Medal, um, the Eli Whitney Award, the Katz Ridley Prize, many other awards, as well as an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Catholic University of America and the John Marshall Law School. He's written lots of articles um, on patent law advocacy. He's taught related courses at the George Washington University, the University of Akron, and the John Marshall Law Schools. He's a frequent speaker. Um, uh, he was appointed a distinguished scholar in residence by um, IPO following his retirement. Um, he continues to remain active in the intellectual property field, um, advising clients, consulting for law firms, um, conducting moot courts, and of course, advising on strategy and mediation and arbitration services. It is an honor to have former uh, Chief Judge um, Michelle here with us, and I will invite him to speak um, um, and set the stage for the debate that will follow. Thank you so much, Professor. And I'm sorry to not be visible, but hopefully am audible to our assembled uh, group. Um, patent eligibility, of course, is the gateway, the threshold. Uh, there are five other tests that have to be met before a patent can be issued or before it can be uh, upheld if challenged in court, but eligibility is the first of the six hurdles. Um, the Patent Act itself in Section 101 uh, established four broad categories as being eligible. They are processes, machines, manufacturers, and compositions of matter. And those four categories have been essentially unchanged since the founding era and the first Patent Act of 1790. Uh, over the many decades since then, however, the Supreme Court has uh, created three broad judicial exceptions uh, to those four categories for laws of nature, first, secondly, products or phenomena of nature, and third, abstract uh, ideas. Now, in my view, for over 200 years, uh, the regime uh, that was in existence until uh, 2012 uh, was entirely workable, was clear enough, and could be consistently uh, applied by patent examiners, by judges, and by others involved. And in fact, uh, challenges to eligibility were quite rare uh, before 2012. Uh, in my 22 years on the court, uh, I remember uh, only two or three uh, such challenges. Uh, but now, uh, 
there has been a sea change. Uh, it occurred in 2012 because of a case which, for shorthand, we refer to as Mayo. Um, before Mayo, a uh, patent claim was ineligible only if it claimed the judicial exception itself. That was actually the word used, itself, uh, meaning essentially uh, uh, covering the uh, law of nature or abstract idea uh, and nothing else so that it would preempt anyone else from using it. After Mayo, uh, the test was subtly changed in the unanimous Supreme Court opinion. So after Mayo, if uh, in the, one of the many elements of a patent claim, one of these exemptions was merely recited, then the claim was presumptively viewed as not eligible and could only become eligible if it was, quote, transformed, end quote, by the other elements of the claim uh, that could be found to reveal a, quote, inventive concept, end quote. After the Mayo case, which was uh, reaffirmed two years later in 2014 in a case we refer to as Alice for short, uh, eligibility challenges in litigation and in the patent office became routine. Hundreds and hundreds of patents uh, granted uh, after full examination by expert examiners in the patent office were invalidated uh, as ineligible. Um, and this new regime, in my view, uh, created a high level of uncertainty, unpredictability, inconsistent results across cases, and impossibility for uh, inventors and investors to have confidence to rely on patents as stable assets. Uh, the case law unintentionally uh, made previously clear doctrine uh, unclear and very difficult to administer, uh, resulting in uh, chaos or what was referred to by former director Capos as a mess. It, mean, it meant that if someone got a patent, uh, uh, it could uh, be later, even many years later, taken away either by the same patent office or by the courts applying the new tests under the Mayo Alice regime. And therefore patents were viewed as no longer sufficiently reliable to incentivize all the investment and invention that they previously had. Perhaps the hardest hit uh, area was medical uh, diagnostics, but also uh, computer implemented inventions such as uh, AI uh, are also now under a cloud when patented because of the way this test works out in practice. Ironically, while the U.S. Uh, narrowed the scope of patent eligibility, uh, the 27 European countries and most major Asian countries, including China, substantially broadened the scope of eligible inventions. And so hundreds and hundreds of actual uh, inventions found ineligible in the United States have later been found eligible in those other jurisdictions. Uh, in the nine years since the Supreme Court Mayo case, the Supreme Court has declined to clarify or revise its Alice Mayo test, uh, despite receiving something in excess of 50 petitions uh, so requesting. Furthermore, the Federal Circuit has struggled to uh, implement the Alice Mayo regime uh, in its tests. Uh, and in doing so, it has expanded the uh, ineligible sta ineligibility standard of the Supreme Court uh, so as to hold essentially all medical diagnostics as a category ineligible. Uh, and there are cases in which uh, that happened over and over and over involving famous institutions, including the Cleveland Clinic. And many of you know about cases such as Athena and Ariosa, in which many of the judges of the federal circuit protested that the invention should be eligible, but they felt unable to find it eligible because of the, the statements of the Supreme Court in the Mayo case and some that were repeated uh, in the Alice case. Um, Judge so, Michelle, can I uh, ask a question while, while we're on this point? Um, sure. It might be helpful for our audience to hear um, what you think the challenges are to addressing the patent eligibility conundrum, and in particular, what efforts has Congress undertaken 
um, in the last few years to address this? And, and do we have any results? Can we expect anything there? What's your sense? Uh, well, um, my view is that it's shared by many, many people, though not universally, is that uh, the law needs much greater clarity, patents need more reliability, and therefore the Congress should clarify its intention as embedded in Section 101 in the four categories I mentioned. And if there are specific things that need to be excluded, such as perhaps uh, patenting of genes, then that could be done legislatively and other things would be viewed as eligible and would get patents if, but only if they could pass the other five tests. Uh, in 2019, uh, then IP subcommittee chairman uh, Coons uh, and ranking member Tillis led an effort uh, to uh, come up with a legislative solution. They held numerous roundtables of uh, 60 or 70 very diverse stakeholders uh, and ultimately held hearings, as you mentioned, in June of 2019, three days of hearings, 45 witnesses. By my count, 40 witnesses agreed the law was a mess and needed to be legislatively corrected. Uh, five disagreed and said the status quo was uh, good enough. Uh, as you mentioned, Professor, the uh, effort uh, stalled over the summer of 2019 and ever since there have been attempts to revive it. And right now there are ongoing negotiations, uh, including uh, some uh, being heard from in these programs. Uh, there, the, there will be a third uh, negotiation session in October supervised by the staff of Senator Tillis. Hard to predict uh, when or if it will bear fruit. Uh, but that's uh, the current state of affairs uh, to try to uh, revive uh, efforts to address legislatively uh, the chaos that has ensued unintentionally from the Alice Mayo regime. So only time will tell. Thank you so much. I, I, let's turn to um, Director Yanku and, and Mr. Jones um, and really open this up. Thank you, uh, Judge Michelle, because I think you've raised um, certainly the leading uh, concerns and the, the pathway here has been uh, long and, and difficult. And, and so let's hear from uh, two individuals who uh, are, are not unknown to this audience. And so I will skip our introductions because they both have lengthy and impressive bios, um, but I suspect you're all here to hear their thoughts um, on this point. And so I'm going to ask um, both Dr. Yanku and, and, and uh, Director Jones, Director Yanku and Director Jones, uh, to speak to the proper function of patent elig eligibility. Um, is that function being served by the current case law, PTO practice and policies? Director Yanko, I'm gonna begin with you. Um, and then Director Jones, I will turn to you. But in light of Judge Michelle's um, uh, reflection and uh, expressions of, of both concern and um, some dismay perhaps at, at where we are, let me start with Director Yanku and then um, turn to Director Jones. What is the proper function of patent eligibility? Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Professor, and uh, great to be with everyone. Um, um, so I generally agree with um, Judge Michel that the law in this area of patent eligibility is in an unpredictable uh, uh, phase right now and has been for about a decade or so. So first of all, why is this important? Like all laws, predictability is key. This is especially true in the patent system. Um, and, uh, and, and why is that? Well, um, uh, innovation and frankly, investment in new technologies in the United States require the private sector. Uh, we need our private sector to participate. The private sector need the certainty of a patent system um, uh, to, uh, to protect the investment they have made in those innovations. Um, and this is true, especially for disruptive technologies, especially for new, newly created technologies, very risky technologies, those that we really don't know if they're gonna work, um, such as uh, the very fast development nowadays <clears throat> of artificial intelligence 
and many other things. So clarity and predictability um, uh, are key. Now, <clears throat> turning to patent eligibility, uh, as Judge Michel said, this is the first threshold question um, when we look at the various requirements as to whether a patent should be granted or not. The very first question we need to ask is, is this um, new creation uh, subject to the patent system at all? Let me make it just very, uh, just give a very simple example. There's lots of new creations in the fine arts, paintings, music, all sorts of things like that, that are not subject to the patent system. Many of them are subject to the copyright system, for example. Scientific, technological, uh, practical applications of those principles usually are subject to the patent system. But what's happened in uh, the past several decades <clears throat> is that the technologies have become more and more difficult to square with the, stat the eligibility statute, which as Judge Michel indicated was written by Jefferson and Madison at the founding of this nation. The statute as originally written um, uh, in 1790, 1793 says, and it's effectively unchanged to this day, um, says that what's patentable are useful processes, machines, manufacturers, or compositions of matter. But as we get into more and more advanced technologies, such as artificial intelligence, potentially you know, blockchain, cryptography, quantum computing, DNA analyses, okay? As brilliant as our founders were and they wrote the statute, they certainly didn't anticipate those things. And the, so the statute haven't, hasn't changed. Technology certainly has changed a lot. And courts have struggled to figure out how to fit these new technologies in to determine, are they subject to the patent system or are they perhaps, or should they be outside of the patent system? So my personal view is that um, since technology has moved so much since the founding of this nation, it is time for our policymakers, Congress in particular, um, uh, to take another look and weigh the pros and cons of the outer bounds as to what's in and what's out of the patent system. Because what we need most of all is clarity and leaving it up to the courts one case at a time has made it very difficult and resulted in the situation we are in right now. One final point before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, David Jones, is this. <clears throat> um, the courts have issued their, uh, it, it's a whole body of law, especially in the past decade on this issue, although it goes back several decades, but very active and most problem arise out of the cases from the last 10 years or so. Uh, but there's a lot of cases. So what the US Patent Office has done, because we see at the US Patent Office approximately 700, over 700,000 patent applications a year that this analysis has to be done on. And there's lots of cases to square these, uh, these new applications with. So what we have done in 2019 is to issue new guidelines to our examiners that synthesize the, uh, the, the court decisions and create um, a more predictable path, an analytical path to make this patentability decision. And the approach, the new analytical approach uh, that we have employed at the patent office since 2019 really has uh, improved the predictability um, of, of uh, patentability decisions. We know this because we, uh, our chief economist at the USPTO issued a study last year that indicated that the uncertainty of examination with respect to this section of the patent code has decreased by 44%. So that's a major improvement. But obviously the administration um, uh, has to work within the existing body of law. We cannot change the body of law. That's only up to Congress. So if we are truly going to uh, uh, stabilize the system and return to a more predictable uh, uh, patentability determination, we need an act of Congress.
So I, I think I hear, thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Director Yonku, who, as just to clarify for the audience, former USPTO director, and, and we will be turning now to hear from um, Executive Director Jones, who is um, with the High Tech Inventors Alliance. But I want to just highlight two things um, that uh, Director Yonku's comments reveal. One is the question of institutional pathway. Uh, is this is this really a job for Congress? Are we at a point of time in history that we've never seen before, where the courts have not been able to recalibrate this this question? Um, but there's also the fact that the federal circuit, you know, doesn't have to, uh, unlike other countries, uh, abide by the PTO's guidance and guidelines. So um, when once we begin the conversation a bit more in a more fulsome way, Director Yanko, I'd be curious to hear um, if you think the predictability um, point that the guidelines might provide is undercut by our unique system in the United States where really we have three different bodies making patent policy in very distinct ways. I'm gonna turn now to um, David Jones who I believe has a different perspective. Um, so over to you, uh, Director Jones, uh, what is the proper function of patent eligibility and, and what is your view is the institutional pathway um, um, where potential change might might be necessary or perhaps not. Thank you, Professor. So uh, I thought my statement uh, kind of was gonna be controversial here that, that the purpose of eligibility is to, to distinguish between subject matter that's appropriate for patenting and subject matter that is not appropriate for patenting. You, it, you wouldn't believe it, but in the Hill debates, that's actually a controversial statement. I think uh, Director Iancu and I, it sounds like we agree on that. So, uh, you know, I think that's the function is is the kind of current eligibility case law performing that function? I guess my answer would be it's not perfect, um, but it is relatively predictable. I mean, not only has there been the 40% decrease in uncertainty in, in kind of in the patent application process and the application of 101 in that context, uh, you know, all the empirical studies that I'm aware of that looked at this have found that in almost all technology areas, applicants responded very, very quickly. Um, to the changes in law and, and drafted different applications. So when you see this kind of new generation of applications that were drafted after Mayo and Alice, you see 101 rejections that, that are in, in many cases with many technologies actually lower than they were prior to these case law developments, right? And, and that suggests that there isn't unpredictability if applicants were able to respond, um, then clearly they were able to predict the outcome in advance uh, you know, when they were drafting their applications. Um, so getting back to the purpose of eligibility, you know, I, I, I think it's important to remind everybody that there's a historical context here, right? So in an in, in, international one, almost every country historically and almost every country currently um, it, it does not allow things like aesthetic creations, as Director Yanku mentioned, um, to be patent eligible. But, you know, it goes way beyond just aesthetic creations. So typically, you know, anything that is an abstract idea is excluded from most of the major patent systems, uh, you know, from patent protection or most of the major patent systems. And I think this is a very important thing to have happen. I mean, there, there's actual empirical evidence that the patenting of abstract ideas reduces rather than increases investments in R&D. In other words, the patenting of things like business methods has exactly the opposite effect of what the patent system is supposed to have. Um, you know, there, at least one scholar had looked at this empirically and found that companies who were obtaining business method patents, right, applying for and being granted business method patents prior to Alice, um, after Alice, increased their investments in R&D because those patents were no longer available. So it's a little counterintuitive, but this is something that, you know, that has been believed by many over a course of several hundred years, um, the, the patent protection should be limited to actual technology, the, you know, the types of fields that you would learn in a vocational school and engineering school, um, rather than pure sciences, aesthetic creations, fine arts, or the social sciences. And I guess to, to conclude, you know, how, how is Alice, how are Alice and Mayo um, doing at, at distinguishing between appropriate and inappropriate Subject matter, I'd say they're doing much better than the prior case law, which allowed eligibility for everything, pretty much. 
Professor, so would you like me to? I know, I know we're, I know you're ready to get at each other, and I, I want to make sure that we don't exclude Judge Michelle from this um, conversation because there is a point of engagement that is critical here, and one is um, Director Young, who, um, Mr. Jones, he, he mentions that actually what you describe as unpredictability and lack of clarity is is proof of success. other words, it, that's not eligible. Now, I want to make that we're actually having the same conversation. Two questions. One is, should we recognize a firm boundary around 101? And so, to whom should we direct the responsibility of deciding Or I just want to keep those two things um, um, in view. Director Yonku, I'm going to invite you to respond. Sure. And um, I didn't get the whole question, Professor, because I think you were going in and out, at least for me. But I think I got the gist yes. of it. Um, uh, just I want to make sure that I'm being heard well. Please interrupt and let me know if I uh, if somehow I'm it's it's on my end. Um, so look, there's uh, there's several things here. Um, number one, and director, I apologize for inter for interrupting, but if you could speak directly also to the AI issue, which is really the the, the question on 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 the table now in in responding, I just wanted to to clarify that. Absolutely. So uh, first of all, with respect to the courts, and you asked this question a little bit earlier, Professor, are the courts uh, undermining the um, administration's own guidelines? Um, look, uh, we, the, the fact is, and this is not going to change, the fact is we have an independent judiciary, and it should be that way. We have separation of powers between the branches. Um, this is a, the, the, the bedrock of, American, of the American constitutional system, and the courts uh, uh, are not uh, bound by what the administration does. Um, uh, but they could voluntarily pick up uh, uh, what uh, the approach that the patent office has done now that we see that it is working very well. In other words, the unpredictability of results, as they've uh, mentioned, and as I mentioned, has indeed gone down at the USPTO. Applicants indeed can predict better now um, during the application process uh, how things are going to turn out. So, and it's working and it's following the case law. It's, it's you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's only, it's not a substantive change that took place at the patent office. It's just an analytical change. It's a framework of analysis to be able to step through it in a logical manner um, that, uh, that, is, is, that, it, that leads to more predictable results. And courts could do that or something similar to it, if not identical. Um, but they're not doing it, and that is what, what leads to unpredictability on the litigation side or whenever things get to the court system. Um, because I do think we have more or less addressed the issue on the, on the administration side, on the patenting side of things. But, but if courts are not going to change their approach, then, then we have a, a, overall the whole system. We don't know what the result will be years down the line when the patent is to be challenged. Mm -hmm. To address a couple of Dave, David's points, um, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis artificial intelligence, I don't think there is a substantive disagreement uh, between what Dave Jones is saying and what I am saying as to what should be in and what should be out. Or if there is, it's a matter of fair debate, and that's what Congress is meant to do, right? Congress balances pros and cons of various things. And decisions can be made. Should business methods be in or business methods be out? Things like that. And I think there's general, more or less, there's never uniformity of, of opinion, but there's general agreement as to the broad categories of things that should be in and should be out. The question is a procedural one. And, and what framework do you follow in order to be able to, be, to decide what is in and what's out? And artificial intelligence is a key example of this. So uh, Dave says um, correctly so that abstract ideas should not be eligible for patenting. I have, me personally, in my personal capacity, I happen to agree with that. 
The question becomes, what is an abstract idea? This is the problem. And this is especially acute in artificial intelligence, perhaps more than anywhere else. A business method where we talk about, gee, how do we increase the number of sales uh, of a particular widget on an internet platform is very different from you know, the processing of information through mathematical formulas in order to uh, enable computers to engage in machine learning and generate new thoughts on their own. Very different. Yet, under the court's approach to abstract ideas, they are treated basically the same. Their mathematical formulations are viewed as abstract ideas to a large extent. The processing of information is viewed as abstract ideas, and there is no boundaries provided by the courts uh, when they do their analysis uh, that, to, that result in a predictable outcome. This is the key, in my opinion. Congress, um, uh, uh, if Congress is to act here, it needs to provide the framework to be able for all of us to distinguish what is the stuff that we don't want to patent, such as the pure business method, for example, if that's the decision made, versus a practical technical application, such as deep learning by machines, which seems, to me at least, I don't know if Dave would agree, but to me at least, it seems like that should be eligible for, for patenting. Absolutely. But at least we need to know what the outcome should be. Oh, Ruth, you're on mute. Thank you so much. I think that, that um, Director Yanka, you've, you've raised um, some counterpoints um, and, and I think also clarified the need for a framework. There's still the, the, and it sounds like you do agree that this is a matter that Congress should attend to. But I, I think, David, as you respond to this, it would be um, helpful to ask the question about implications. What are the implications of our current doctrine for the advancement of AI and other emerging technologies like quantum, quantum computing? If we frame it as a, nas a question of national competitiveness, should that change the way we view 101? Is 101 um, effective as a vehicle for for concerns about national competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other nations. That seems to be the elephant that is certainly part of the parade of elephants whenever we have this debate. So, so David, let me let you respond to the director and, um, and also to Judge Michelle, who also um, spoke very um, clearly about the need for uh, Congress's um, intervention. Thank you, Ruth. A couple of points in response to Director Yanka. We, yeah. I think, you know, if you're listening to this, it's going to sound like we, we agree mostly, and I actually think we do agree mostly on, on this. The real sticking point is, so, so any, any eligibility system to be workable has to do two things. One, it has to define what's eligible and distinguish that from what's ineligible, but it also has to deal with situations where you just include token language in your claims, right? So, so if abstract ideas are out, the question becomes, what do you do if you claim an abstract idea and then add the magic words on a computer, right? And if that makes abstract ideas patent eligible, then at least in, in the world that I live in, in the tech world, everything operates on a computer. You know, nowadays, almost everything in the world involves a computer. If just adding those words on a computer or adding a preamble that says a processor configured to is sufficient to satisfy the eligibility requirements, then you go back to a system where you actually just have no line at all, right? Anything is patent eligible, you just have to add the kind of token magic words. Um, as to the unpredictability in litigation, since this is an AI form, there, there's a, a very interesting paper out there where a guy used a, an off-the-shelf module, AI module, machine learning, um, and trained it using claims that have been held invalid and got the AI, and it was relatively simply, it was not using like advanced semantic, um, semantic analysis or anything like this. It was just a word salad approach. He got to about an 80% accuracy rate, which in the law is pretty high. So I, I think, you know, in, in litigation as well, it's relatively predictable how cases are gonna come out. 
Um, and I'm blanking on what you asked. Oh, US competitiveness. So yes, let's, let's switch to that because that is a key issue. I think the, the important point here is that the US PTO grants more patents to foreign inventors than US inventors. Right, and, and, and that's something that's important to realize is, is the international context here. Under the TRIPS agreement, all the TRIPS signatory countries, the member countries, and I think there are something like 164, 165 of those, so it's basically the entire world, everywhere you'd want a patent, um, are obligated to treat foreign inventors in exactly the same way as they treat domestic inventors, and to treat foreign inventions in exactly the same way as they treat, um, as they treat US inventions. As a result of that, any change that you make in the law isn't gonna have an effect on your in international competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis any of these other kind of TRIPS member countries. There, you, know, you cannot incentivize somebody through the patent law that you have domestically to either do, you know, bring R&D from another country to the United States or migrate R&D from the United States to another country. Because you know, the, the inventor who's in the US, you know, let's take China as an example. The inventor who's in the US, it frustrated with Alice perhaps, is gonna be, you know, if he moves his R&D or she moves her R&D to China to get a US patent, she will still have to face that frustration with Alice, right? So that's completely unchanged. And she can get a Chinese patent from the US, right? So changing the R&D, moving things from one jurisdiction to another has no impact on R&D choices by companies. I mean, it, 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 at least with respect to kind of R&D choices that might be based on the patent system. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't play into these decisions. Okay, um, let's pause for a brief minute so that I can um, have our administrators who are wonderfully behind the scenes display the CLE course code. Um, many folks are, are taking precious time away from billing hours. And so let's make sure that uh, they get the course code for this. Um, for those of you who are calling in, um, the course code is RCLS887. Let me repeat it. The course code is R for Robert, C for Charlie, L for like, S for Sam, Eight eight seven. Thank you. So, Judge Michelle, I, I wanted to to invite you to um, res to intervene briefly um, to what is the emerging tension between um, uh, David's point and uh, Director Yanku's point, um, and you have clearly articulated uh, a need in your view for congressional action. And I think something that certainly patent law students, my patent law students are interested in hearing about and um, is, well, why is this different? Why is artificial intelligence different? Um, and what are the implications of that difference if Congress does not act? Well, artificial intelligence, according to numerous experts is the key technology of the future that will infuse itself into almost every uh, kind of product and activity. So it couldn't be uh, more important. Uh, and it's clear that in advanced technologies of the new century, uh, most invention is very expensive and therefore strong incentives are needed to convince people who control money, whether they're corporate CEOs or venture capitalists or others to make those risky slow investments. And that's why it's so important for the patent system uh, to work in this area uh, as in others. You know, when David Jones says uh, there's plenty of predictability, at least that's what I heard him to be saying, uh, maybe there is in his eye. But when I look at 100 federal circuit or district court cases, and I read the patents, uh, and then I try to guess what will the outcome be as to eligibility I have no idea and I'm wrong almost all the time. The line doesn't exist. It's not just unclear, it doesn't exist. And what's happening is judges are eyeballing a claim and saying it looks abstract to me, case dismissed without claim construction, without evidence, without prior art, without expert testimony, it's complete a chaos. So you don't have the predictability that's needed to incentivize the investments because of a failure at the courts 
first the Supreme Court with vague statements in Alice and Mayo and two other cases, but particularly Alice and Mayo. And the Federal Circuit has completely failed, in my view, uh, to clarify the law, to rationalize it, to make it more consistent or coherent. And in fact, it's actually made it much worse because it's front loaded into the eligibility analysis all the other five tests like adequate written description, full enablement, uh, uh, claim definiteness, non-obviousness, novelty. Uh, so now everything is uh, a matter of eligibility, and it's the defensive choice in virtually every case, and the results are unpredictable. So um, capital is fleeing the United States and fleeing hard technology for less risky investments, and that's true of both venture capital and also corporate capital. So we're, we're destroying our future uh, because we can't get our act together. So David, I see that you want to jump right in there. So I'm going to let you have a 30 second comment, or let's say 90 sure. second comment. In I mean, I have to say, I, I just don't think that's accurate. Again, under the TRIPS agreement, there is no reason R&D would be migrating to other countries. And when you look at what people say, you know, when people are asked, corporations are asked, Kind of, you know, are you moving kind of money to Asia for R&D? Are you moving R&D functions to Asia? And if so, why? The top things that they list are, you know, nothing to do with the patent system. It's like access to markets, access to human capital, these types of things, right? So to the extent that R&D is migrating, it's clear that it's not migrating because of patents. As to the predictability issue, I, I guess all I can say is, you know, a guy actually trained in AI to get to, you know, I think an 80% accuracy in predicting. Um, so, you know, to say that it's absolutely unpredictable, I think is just not true. And I guess my last point would be, you know, I, I, I didn't really give my spiel about who HTIA is, but you can think of it as a bunch of big tech companies. Right? And, but, you know, my members include, uh, you know, a, a number of the top patent owners in AI and a number of the top patent owners in quantum computing, right? These are, these are the leading companies in the world doing this stuff. And they tell me that there's no problem here, that they don't have a problem in litigation, that they don't have a problem obtaining appropriate patent uh, protection from the office. And, you know, I think it's important to recognize that the industry itself, right? I mean, I have two members that have actually produced a working quantum processor, which only a handful of, of entities in the world have done. So, you know, the people that are really doing the cutting edge work here don't feel that there's a big problem. They, they just simply don't agree. Professor, if I could respond, I'll take 30 seconds. Yes, please. And, and, and actually, it's important to ask this question. Um, so, Director Yonko, I was going to put it to you as you responded. You know, the TRIPS agreement, which David has raised, does require no discrimination in fields of technology. So one question that we ought to, as mostly lawyers gathered around this webinar, is are we in violation of TRIPS by not including AI as uh, PESM is that is that something that concerns you as a former director of the USPTO, um, and I think then for all of you I will invite you to weigh in later on the question of impact. One of our challenges is that 101 applies to all technologies, all industries, all companies, and all sizes, and um, the nuancing that happens happens at the court level, and 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 we may need to think about that. But Director Yanku, could you address the question of trips violation? Yeah, look, there are some uh, folks out there that do argue that this uh, the de facto rules uh, uh, created by the 101 jurisprudence in the United States uh, does create a uh, uh, violation of TRIPS because as a de facto man matter, certain areas of technologies are of technology are out of our patent system. For example, uh, diagnostic techniques you know, that tests to diagnose whether we have a, a human being has a certain condition or not. Um, uh, you know, uh, by the federal circuit has said that by and large, uh, th none of those have been approved for patenting uh, under the recent, uh, under their recent jurisprudence. Um, well, if that's the case, that's an area of technology that uh, is being treated differently than others. So some have argued that uh, that is a TRIPS violation, similar type uh, arguments vis-a-vis -vis information processing uh, te techniques. 
Having said that, I personally don't uh, have a view on that. I don't know if this is actually a technical violation of TRIPS, but I don't think that's either here, uh, neither, I, I think that's neither here nor there because the issue, the real issue is um, what is the impact on innovation in the United States? Ultimately, what we really, look, the patent system is a tool. It's a very important tool, but it's just a tool for the ultimate goal of, of creating more innovation and, and getting more technologies invented and brought to market. Um, let's keep in mind um, uh, the, you know, a, a real important aspect of innovation is the investment of capital in brand new, very risky technologies and ventures. And we have to keep in mind the startups, the small, uh, the small and medium enterprises, and all the companies that depend on venture capital investment and need that, need a, a reliable patent system to secure that investment. And if that doesn't happen in the United States, if those protections are not in the United States, therefore reducing the amount of investments, private sector, venture investment in these risky technologies, that, uh, that capital is gonna flee overseas. But they, Director Yanku, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but David who represents many of these companies says that's not happening. He doesn't represent these companies. That's the thing, he represents Google, um, uh, he, I, I don't want to speak for his membership, but I believe it's Google, Cisco, Intel, uh, Microsoft, Salesforce. I'm sure I'm le leaving Intel, somebody. Micron, out. Samsung, and I'm probably leaving somebody out, so I'll get in trouble after this. But um, it, you get the idea. It's, it's large tech companies. He, so, so Dave represents large tech companies that are very important. That are very important players in the space. But they have other business calculus calculations. So for them, whether they do the R and D in China or in the United States, maybe it doesn't make a big of a difference. Having said that, I think the proof in the pudding is where is the United States right now, vis-a-vis -vis China, on many of the technologies of the next industrial revolution. Take deep learning, for example. China takes out six times as many patents worldwide than the United States. Take 5G and 6G. Um, where, where is the United States vis-a-vis -vis those technologies and installations around the world? We're not even close. And then take artificial intelligence. All you have to do is read the excellent report from NSEAI on these issues to see the competitive threat under which we are now. Now, there are many issues that go into this, but intellectual property protection is a key ingredient to making sure that enough investment is made in the United States in our AI and all of these other technologies so that we can compete on the innovation in the innovation uh, ecosphere on a worldwide scale. And Ruth, if so, I could just kind of respond to that very quickly. Okay, I, please do. And then there's a question from the audience that I want to really um, pose to, sure. to, to the both of you. I, I just don't think that the kind of the, the impact on investment in R&D is being accurately stated. I mean, the, the, one of the points of the international patent system set up under TRIPS was to divorce the location in which the invention was conceived from the entitlement to patent rights, right? So you have exactly the same ability to patent if you do the R&D in the United States or in China. Therefore, any kind of domestic patent issue cannot, by definition, create an incentive to move R&D to another country. It just, it just doesn't happen. Um, it, 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 but, but, but that well, it may true. not happen by itself. I mean, I, I would take the medium point between you and, and the director. It, it may not be the sole consideration, but I think the director is saying it is a consideration. Director, you wanted to respond? Yeah, if you look, look at venture capital dollars for small and medium companies. There are small companies that want to start their businesses here in the United States. What are we saying? What are we saying that they should go do it in China because their capital is more secure there if they come up with a new thing? Now, I understand that if you invent something in China and then you can, you can still apply for a patent here in the United States, but that's not directly germane to the main point, which is what do we need to do here to, invent, to, to incentivize 
new dollars, new companies, new startups, and new technologies to be developed here in the United States. So somebody asked a question about whether the problem is language. In other words, why is AI such an issue? If we replace it with machine learning or applied statistics, would it be different? No, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it's just a language problem. AI is fundamentally different from many of the things that came before. In part, it's because you know, most of the AI research that's being done now is being done in the area of machine learning. And that, that results in some kind of quite odd interactions with the patent system, but mostly in my view, outside of the kind of the 101 context creates real kind of, you know, in my view, again, one of three and 112 issues. Yeah. So look, I, I agree with that. And the fact is, I don't think Dave and I would disagree on the fundamentals here. It's not a question, uh, the fundamental of uh, whether a particular technology in this area should be patentable or not. It's not a question whether it's machine learning or artificial intelligence, the, 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 the phraseology. The key here is the unpredictability because these technologies use mathematical formulas and algorithms. They're very practical results from these algorithms. They do stuff for us, but because they use math, the Supreme Court has said that, look, because they use math, that could be abstract. And unless there's something more beyond that, we cannot be patenting math. I think there's broad agreement with that point, but the question then becomes is, what is it beyond the pure math that you need? And this is what the courts have left unsaid to a large degree. And this is why I believe that we need clarification from the legislature on that point. Um, but obviously there's disagreement on that specific point, whether we need further clarification. Or whether in, in true common law style, the evolution of the law will adjust um, over time. David, you have the last word. Uh, so I'd, I'd take any clarity I can get, right? So, so no system is is perfect, um, and and you know I I completely agree that increasing clarity and predictability is always a good thing in legal systems. I guess my question is is an institutional one: is is Congress and any act of Congress likely to increase predictability and clarity? And you know, on this particular topic, I would say no. I, you know, I, I'll also point out that there are economic studies out there that have looked at what happened to venture capital after Alice for small kind of software and, and tech startups and found that, you know, they've found across the board that it was associated with increased access to venture capital rather than decreased uh, access to venture capital by U.S. startups. Well, let me just say thank you to our panelists for a really rich and honest debate. This is an important question, not only for patent policy, but really for national competitiveness and our consideration of what we can do with the patent levers. So thank you to Director Yanku, to, to David Jones, to former Chief Judge Michelle. We're so grateful. Thank you so much. We will reconvene in 10 minutes for a more full-throated debate. Thank you to our audience for your participation as well.